Estados Unidos y en México como CEO, presidente por cinco ocasiones, acumula 30 años de experiencia en empresas. Asistió a la Universidad de California en Berkeley y obtuvo una licenciatura en Ciencias Políticas y Economía. Mientras asistía a Berkeley, se adelantó a la candidatura del doctorado en el programa de economía. Le otorgaron las becas Rockefeller y la AEA y se convirtió en presidente de la Sociedad de Estudiantes para las Artes. Fue elegida como miembro de por vida de la Orden del Oso de Oro y se desempeñó como presidente de la Asociación de Graduados de Economía. Fue presidente del Consejo de Administración del Décimo Distrito en el Federal Reserve Bank también ha trabajado en Euronet Worldwide, una compañía internacional de pagos, y el ferrocarril Kansas City Southern, propietaria de la Kansas City Southern de México. Ha conducido varios talleres y es una voz autorizada en la gestión empresarial, las comunicaciones de mercadotecnia, tecnología reciente, la inversión de capital privado y las iniciativas empresariales. Les pido un muy fuerte aplauso para recibir en este escenario a Lu Córdoba. Hello, welcome. I'm Lou Cordova, and she gave me an introduction, and I'm not sure how many people in the audience do speak English mostly or have your translators. Well, good. Um, I am going to go over uh, what I've done in Mexico, and it will be the good, the bad, and the ugly. But just to not leave you with ugly, I will end up with the good. But the first thing I want to go over let me see if I've got this right here, is a saying that I have. And this relates to one of the questions that was asked earlier. And the saying is that no one's an entrepreneur because they want to be. They simply have no choice. And what that means is that what you have to go through as an entrepreneur is not always pretty. And you do need the perseverance, as somebody mentioned, and following your heart, as somebody mentions. But you get kicked a lot. And I'm going to tell you some war stories today. And if at the end of hearing all these war stories about why you should not have a startup, and especially not in Mexico, you still want to do your startup, then you know that you're an entrepreneur and that you simply have no choice. So the first thing I'm going to do is go over a little background. Because if you look at our backgrounds, that's where we come from. And that's what brings us here today. So my background is my father, Federico Benito Córdoba, nació en Tampico, México, Tamaulipas. My mother, Joan Frances McGinnis, was Irish. So what happens when you mix Mexican tequila and Irish whiskey and you add a layer of Catholicism? Well, you get 12 children. You know this is true. I'm number six. I'm the well-balanced middle child. My, both of my parents were entrepreneurs. My father was in construction. My mother started self-storage. Now remember this. He was in construction. She was in self-storage. This is important for the test at the end. Okay. So they're both entrepreneurs. 11 out of the 12 children were entrepreneurs. And the 12th one, actually the firstborn, she was the president of Purdue, the chief scientist at NASA, ran the Smithsonian, and now runs the National Science Foundation. So we think she did okay. We're still going to let her be part of the family. So by being an entrepreneur, and from a family of entrepreneurs, they say it is in the genes, and it might be in the genes, because you lead an entire life of this. And so this next one, if it'll move, This is my entire life on one PowerPoint slide. And what I want to walk you through is what skill sets I found along the way that wound up leading me to the end, to Mexico, to right now. Hopefully that's not the end. So it started off when I was 12 years old, I started my first business. I ran a carnival. 
I uh, created games, I invited the neighborhood, they paid 50 cents to come in. I made games out of trash, which is now considered recycled materials. And for prizes, I gave out the little prizes that you get in cereal boxes a long time ago. I would empty out all the cereal, take the prize before any of my 11 siblings got to it, put all the cereal back in so that they could eat it. And from this first experience as an entrepreneur at age 12, I realized the excitement of taking a thought and making money out of it. And when you have as an allowance a nickel a week, that's five cents a week allowance, you really need to augment that income even at age 12. So I started off here, and I went on in college to get myself through college by doing different things on my own, graphic arts and other things. And then when I graduated Berkeley, I was working for a company called Money Market Services. This is where I got my financial background, both at Berkeley as an economist and at Money Market Service. We did real-time financial market analysis of the, mostly the bond markets. So I got to know how New York works, how the financial markets and big finance works. But I also got my first taste of a sale of a company because we sold MMS to McGraw-Hill and we were part of Standard & Poor's. It's right about the time where I got married as well. And I married an economist too, so I was surrounded by economics. And so the taste of a sale is wonderful and it really sticks with you. It makes you a little bit of a deal junkie here. And at Standard & Poor's though, what I learned was how to work in corporate America. And this is important. If you're going to be an entrepreneur, a lot of people just jump in, but you haven't really learned how big business works. So I would encourage everybody to spend some time in corporate America truly understanding how big business works, because that was invaluable to me to learn that lesson. And from there, they kept trying to get me into New York, didn't really want to go into New York. I had a daughter at that time, and I didn't want to raise her in New York. And lo and behold, beneath my feet, the internet erupts. I'm in the Silicon Valley, and here I've got the internet. So I went over to Excited Home. It was a startup at the time. It was, it was going to bring high-speed broadband internet to everyone. And that was going to change the world. I truly felt it would change the world. I think it did change the world. I think everybody in this audience has high-speed internet, and this company is what brought it. So that was exciting because that was a first huge startup. My first, I was one of the first people at, at home. This is before we bought Excite. My first desk was a Sun workstation box turned over on its end, and I was in the hallway. This was an incubator space. And we grew it to a multi-billion dollar company, took it public, merged with Excite, and then you really have the internet bug once you've done that second sale and you've really gotten big at this point. Now here's where I made a critical transition. I went from Excite at home to running my first bigger company. I had bigger meaning relative to the carnival. So I, I got brought in by some entrepreneurs that were having trouble running their business, which is an online ticketing company, and they brought me in to run it. We grew that, we sold that as well. It still exists today, it's called Activa. And that got me into e-commerce. Now remember, I had a finance background, so e-commerce and the technology years, these all kind of came together and worked out well. So I ran my own company there, really loved that. At the same time, I started doing a little bit of investing. I invested in a company called Commerce One at $10 a share. It went public and went to $600 a share. And then I put it into an exchange fund. And so here's another thing that you should understand if you're going to get into this world, that highly concentrated stock positions are bad. Because if you have all your money in one basket and you drop the basket, you lose everything. So if you're going to make some money, you better be smart about how to hold on to that money. Okay? So an exchange fund is where you and a bunch of other people who have highly concentrated stock positions put all their money together, and you have a percentage share of this big pool. I did that with two things, with the stock I got from At Home Network and with the stock I got from Commerce One. Had I not done that, both of those companies went to zero. But because I was in exchange funds, along with GE, Google, Microsoft, and others, I did fine. 
I was the winner out of that, and there were some, the ones who had mine, they lost everything, but of a tiny piece. So that was an important lesson for me to learn that. I knew as an economist that you don't want to have a high-risk position, so that helped me along the way for Activa. And, and then, since I was doing pretty well, I was feeling good. I was feeling like, wow, this making money is easy. I had a daughter who was about three or four years old. I really wanted to spend more time with her. I had made enough money. I felt pretty comfortable. And so I decided to retire. So here's where a confession comes in. I am absolutely incompetent at retiring. I just don't do it very well. I keep trying, and I keep thinking practice makes perfect, so one of these days, maybe I'll retire. But this was my first time to retire, and what I did was I moved to Colorado, brought my daughter with me. I was divorced at the time, but he came too to keep all our family together. We moved to Colorado, and I was going to retire. I volunteered at a business incubator that was in trouble, that I knew how to fix. I wound up running it. This business incubator started off helping maybe three companies a year, had maybe 15 people who advised these companies. By the time that I left four and a half years later on a vision that we put together, we helped over 100 companies a year. We had 8,000 mentors in our database that were all senior people who would come to help a company. We'd started Sea Tech Angels, which is a group of individual investors. And within six months, it was the largest group of individual investors in the entire Rocky Mountain region. With all these mentors helping these companies, when the companies were ready, we had then the money to fund them to go to the next level. Many, many of these companies still exist today. They're great companies. I want to give you one example of how important it is to have this for anybody who's interested in incubators and the power behind them and the mentorship behind it. We had one company that was still pretty new. It had a special disk drive, and it had, um, it had just gotten wind of a government request for proposal. These requests for proposals, are due very, it, it was due in two weeks. It was about this thick. They had never seen one before and had no idea how to respond to one of these government proposals. We send out an alert to our database of 8,000 people. Five people came through, worked through the entire government proposal with them, got it out in time. They won the contract, and to, to this day, they're doing um, government service and doing great business by it. So we made that company successful just with the help of mentorship. So that's so important for you. I wanted to dwell on that for just a minute. So CTEC was a wonderful, wonderful time of giving back for me and giving back what I knew how to do, which is take an idea and turn it into a business, looking at accounting, looking at legal, looking at some of those things. From there, I got asked to be on the board. I'm going to jump a little ahead here. I got asked to be on the board of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. I was first on their Economic Advisory Council, and then they asked me to be on the board, and then I became chairman of the board. From that vantage point, I really got to understand how governments work, how cross-border policies affect small companies. So it was a huge education. I, I like to say I should have paid tuition for what I learned on the Fed, especially during those tumultuous years where the economy fell apart. It was all during 2008. I was there for 10 years, uh, was my term on the Fed. I also got asked to be on the board of the Kansas City Southern Railroad. Now, this is a railroad which at first seemed bizarre to me that I would be on the board of a monopoly piece. But what the link is here that you should know is that the Kansas City Southern and the Kansas City Southern de Mexico, it's one of the two largest railroads in all of Mexico. It's the only one that goes north-south in the U.S., and it brings industry and commerce all the way through Mexico to both coasts. I mean, this is an alternative Panama Canal. And it's this railroad that 
brings all the goods made in Mexico, not all the goods, but cars and a lot of the goods made along our route up into the United States. So the cross-border ties that we have with Mexico are extremely strong. The guy who runs our Mexico company is Jose Sosaya, who's president of the Americas Chamber, in fact. I also got asked to be on the board of Euronet worldwide. Euronet has hundreds and thousands of ATMs across Europe and Asia. It, um, it does mobile top-ups. It does a lot of different things, but the thing you probably most well-known for now is we do the Walmart to Walmart money transfer. And so if you go to Walmart and transfer money, you'll, you'll use our service to do that. And what Euronet specializes in is those people who are the unbanked. And by unbanked, I'll get to it a little bit later too. These are the people who don't go to banking services. They live off of the debit card, and we are able to move money in and out of that debit card. So now I want to go over the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I won't go over every bit of good, bad, and ugly because there's a lot of all of them. But I will go over the differences between the U.S. and Mexico because I am half Mexican and half American, and, and one of the things I provide on the railroad board is that in operating in both countries, I can understand where the cultures break down and where the economics work and where they don't work. So first I'm going to start with the good. And I will tell you, in the U.S., building is tough. This is my favorite thing to do in Mexico is build. It's easier in the U.S., people get up in the morning wanting to thwart you. They do everything. They don't like building in the U.S. So they get up and they try to prevent you from building. And these are smart people, so it's a real game to build in the U.S. And you feel like you are Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz because you have to bring them the broomstick of the Wicked Witch of the West just to get a license. Whereas in Mexico, they love building. It means jobs. It means progress. It means advancement. So the, in Mexico, they want to help you build. And in fact, at one point in Mexico, we were building in Cabo, and Semarnat decided that it wanted us to do an environmental impact report. Now, they had never done one for storage. This is self-storage. It, it's not that common in Mexico. They had no idea where to begin to do an environmental impact report for us. So we wrote it for them. You can't write your own environmental impact report in the U.S. But we did write it in Mexico, and we handed it to them, where they then said, oh, that looks great, and checked it, and gave us our clearance. And we gave it to them in Word, so... With word format, they could then use it for all the other environmental impact reports that they didn't know how to do. They could use it as a template. That kind of thing would never, ever happen. So why do I have Mexican food up on the Mexico side? It's not that building is a feast. It's a secret that I learned, and it's called the lunch hour. Now, when I first heard that... Mexicans take lunch between 2 and 4 or 3 and 5. I thought it was crazy. I thought that's the most inefficient thing I've ever heard. I mean, you're going to go and eat a big meal, and then you're going to go back and work from 5 to 7? It just made no sense to me. And then I realized that for a little extra money paying somebody on their lunch hour, your licensing application could go from the three-month pile to the, I'll get it done today on my lunch hour. It's amazing what you can do on people's lunch hours if you pay them for their lunch hours. So lunch has become my favorite productive time of day when we ever have to get anything done in building. And where it took us four years to get permits on a project that we were doing in California, it would take us about four days to get it done in Mexico. So for all those people who ask me, oh, is it easier to build in Mexico or the U.S.? It's easier to build in Mexico, and you can do it on your lunch hour. Here's some of the other good things. So the income potential, now I'm going to get a little bit more specific about storage, but I think it relates to other things as well. So the income potential, 
the prices, and I, and I work in Mexican resort areas, so the prices are about the same as the U.S. for storage and for parking. We do airport parking as well. Maybe a little lower, but, but similar. But here's what's different. All the ancillary businesses. So we not only do parking and storage, but we do mail and consignment sales and auction sales and all kinds of other things. And the reason we can do that is because there's a lot of stuff broken in Mexico. And where something is broken, there is opportunity. And so we can provide that opportunity. And so the income potential is much higher here. An average store, storage facility in the U.S. clears about 500,000 to maybe three quarters uh, uh, of million. Here you can clear over a million. That's the difference in ratios. The other thing is lower expenses. This does not include CFE. CFE has got to be our second line item on our expense sheet. The power for commercial purposes is ridiculous, and I'm hoping the new energy reforms will help that, but right now it really makes small businesses suffer, is, is the CFE. But the other expenses are all either the same as the U.S. or they're lower. And especially, I'll just jump to the cheap labor. Labor is cheaper in Mexico. So anything that involves labor, you can, you can do it better. And the risk is more diversified. So, for example, in the U.S., our storage facilities have mostly consumers, and they're all Americans. In Mexico, we have both Mexicans and Americans and Canadians and Europeans as customers. We have both consumers, but about 50% of our business is from businesses because nothing is, uh, nothing is manufactured in resort areas. Everything's brought in. So in a resort area, you need place to store things because you're bringing in all these materials. So we're very well diversified. We have a natural FX hedge in terms of dollars and pesos that we take in. So it works out really well for us. The bottom line is that the net income, of course, is, is wonderful. And we, did, we doubled our growth our first year, and we've been doing double-digit growth every single year since in terms of revenue. So we love that part of Mexico. Now let's talk about the bad. So accounting. I don't know how many of you are in cash businesses, but to, be, to have to do monthly accounting, that's just crazy. I mean, that's a huge burden on small businesses because if you're starting a small business, guess who's doing all the accounting monthly? You or your sister or your cousin or, or somebody. I mean, you're the ones who have to do this. There's a huge burden on the accounting that's involved. Banking. The bank fees here are three, four, five times what they are in the U.S. The loan rates are double what they are in the U.S. The banking, sir, I used to tell myself as soon as I left the Fed, I was going to go start a bank in Mexico because it doesn't feel like the banks understand how to really serve small business. And what you have to realize is just like in the U.S., in Mexico, small businesses create 80% of the jobs of the country. If you don't help small business, you're not helping your country grow. So there's this, this lack of understanding of that on some level that makes it really hard for small businesses. And the corruption. Now, when I first, about a year into this project in Mexico, I was thinking that swindling gringos was a, a, just a national sport. And, uh, and, and I treated it that way. It became kind of a, a fencing match, a sport. And then I realized that, that some of it's just, again, a different culture. I explain it to some of my Grigo friends like this. I'll say, if you're in, a, in an office environment and you share a kitchen and you leave a box of donuts on the table, everyone says, okay, somebody left a box of donuts on the table. I can go have a donut. No one thinks twice about taking a donut when it's laying on the table in the main kitchen area. But if it's in the refrigerator with your name on it, nobody takes it. Well, in Mexico, if you leave hammers and tools and things just out, it's like leaving a box of donuts on the table. It's accepted that you must not want it if it's there. So there are some cultural differences, but there's also some 
that accepts the level of petty graft that was really hard for me to take. Um, I have had every single employee take something. That's tough. Um, out of hundreds of employees in the U.S., I've maybe had one or two take something. And out of just dozens of employees in Mexico, I've had every single one. So I'm having a hard time dealing with that. That's something I'm getting my arms around. Some of that is understanding where they come from and, and, and kind of the access they have to all this. Some of that's education. And that's the next thing is education. Most of the people who work for me are on the contributor level. They've never had a computer before they came to my shop. And I want to give you an example of, of what it's like there that, that you don't normally think of. So every day, you're supposed to, if you work for me, you're supposed to walk the yard, which means go through all the storage areas and mark down if anyone's been there, if everything looks good. So you walk the yard and you mark it on a little sheet. And the sheet just has all the numbers of all the units and all the parking spaces. So you just check up on the sheet. Does everything look okay? So I went down to Cabo, where we have our main facility, and I walked the yard, and I could tell that nobody's walked the yard, because you're supposed to put everything a certain way, and I could just tell. So I came back, I have a friend. I came back, and I said, Eric, it doesn't look like anyone's walked the yard in a while. Why is that? And he said, oh, Miss Lou, the printer's broken. The printer's broken. Okay? Eric, what does the printer have to do with walking the yard? Well, if the printer's broken, they couldn't print out the sheets that had the numbers on them to go mark off all the units. I said, Eric, why didn't you just get a blank sheet of paper and write all the numbers down? And he said, oh, that's a good idea. I said, Eric... How long has the printer been broken? Three months. So I, I tell that story to people, and they just can't quite believe it. Yet on the other hand, Eric's done some things. He's my manager down there. He's done some things that show such ingenuity. So there's this disconnect from resourcefulness. And that's another challenge that I have to constantly stay on top of because I would never have dreamed that a printer would have so much power. Right? So it's something that I've found I do have to pay attention to, and that's about education. So we spend a lot more time training people down there, and we find the more we educate them, the more it helps them and us. This is one of my favorite cartoons on the bottom. It says... Um, could you please elaborate on, and then something bad happened. Bad things do happen. But one of the things that happens is that you've got these regressive policies that are in the government that hurt small business. And I'll go over one explanation of, or one example later. But the other thing is a four-letter word that begins with F, and it's Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Now, if you are a Mexican doing business in Mexico, you don't worry about that because you don't have the foreign part. But for Americans doing business, and especially for people like me who have two passports, Mexican and American, you can't do anything wrong. Nothing wrong, especially for somebody like me who sits on two public boards. No morditas. I'll tell you how this hurts. So one day... Los Cabos Airport decided that we could no longer bring any customers back from the airport. They're trying to compete with us. They have their own parking area. And so they, didn't, they wanted to hurt us, and so they made this that all of the parking areas nearby, no one could come get clients and bring them back to their cars. Well, this is a big deal. So I went and talked to the other competitors, and I said, what are you doing about it? They said, oh, we just pay off the federales, and it's business as usual. We just have to add another line item to our expense. So they just keep picking people up, just like they used to, and they just pay the security out in front to look the other way. I can't do that. 
So I have a competitive disadvantage. And every foreigner doing business in Mexico has a competitive disadvantage to the Mexicans doing business in Mexico. But it does prevent Mexicans from coming up to the U.S. and growing their business up here because then they'll be hit with this same inhibitor that I am hit with. And this is a serious thing, and it gets more serious as you get into public companies. You may have heard about Walmart getting caught for bribing. And I know one of the members who are on the board of directors at Walmart, and we talked about how pervasive this is. It's a way to get things done. And the difference between bribing and using somebody's lunch hour is a receipt. If you get a receipt, it's not bribing. So we get receipts for everything. What's shocking is how many people will give you receipts for just doing their, their own job. So this is, this is a, a tough thing to get around. We have to be more creative in terms of what we do here uh, to get around these things. In this particular case, we made a deal with Budget Rental Car. They pick up all of our people. And guess what? I don't have to pay for a shuttle anymore. So I actually came out ahead. Instead of my expenses going up, they've gone down. And we worked it out. It took us about six months, but the solution is actually better than if we had just bribed the federales like everybody else. But now we get to the good stuff. Now we get to storage wars. So you all know about the drug wars. Now picture having 30 investors in Mexico, and the year after you put all your money in, the, the drug wars hit. And you're like, Really? <laughs> Don't worry about it. It's everywhere but the resort areas. And then somebody gets shot in Acapulco, and they happen to live in Colorado where we're based, and that's not a good excuse anymore. And we're looking into going into 10 places across Mexico. And so the, the drug wars have really hurt us quite a bit. And, and just to step back and then go into the two other things, because remember I told you before that that CFE was like our second line item and, and labor was our third line item. Most, most companies, labor's their first. It's our third. I didn't tell you what our first line item is, and that's legal. So when I started this, and the way I started it, it was back at SeaTech and SeaTech Angels, I met a lot of investors. And we did a few different things together, and one of them had a good idea to come down to Mexico and to start um, to build a condo that came with toys, jet skis, boats, things like that. So we went down there. About four hours, I realized that's not going to happen. People make those decisions separately. You buy your condo for one reason. You buy your boat or jet ski for another reason. But then it started wondering. Now, remember, my mother was in storage, right? So I grew up with this as a family business. Where do people keep their toys? So I started looking around at all the storage places. Every single one of them was full to capacity and had been full since the manager could remember. One of them was building storages one unit at a time on concrete and had it rented before the door went on. That's how big the demand was. So I started penciling some numbers from my economics background, sent them to my sister, who was now running the storage facilities in California. They came out looking pretty good. And that's what got me to go back to my investor friends and said, let's build 10 of these across Mexico. And then we'll sell them all. Because some people have read the book, Built to Last. Anybody read the book, the very famous book, Built to Last? Well, I build the flip. It's just what I do. I build a company, and we sell it. And that's, for me, that's what I do best. So we have this great idea. We go into Mexico. Our building goes great. The recession hits us, but I love a recession after you've collected the money because then you can build really cheaply. So our return on investment went up with the recession because we could build so cheaply. So we're doing well. And then we start realizing all the little gotchas, which they're always there. They're just bigger than I thought. So let's get back to the highest line item, legal. I'll start off with a little one, then bigger three examples. We have land in Mausalan. We built a fence. Hurricane down, came, blew the fence down. So we were going to put the fence back up. The fence was still there. It just needed to be upright. So we hired a company. 
they took the fence completely down, said it was unusable. It, I thought it was usable, but they said it was unusable. And we paid them for all the materials to put a new fence up. They, did need, they didn't. They just didn't. We asked why they didn't put the fence up. They didn't respond to us. And this is a big company in Mazatlan. This is not a small company. And then we were told by a local person down there, don't mess with them, they're with the cartel. Just walk away. So we put the fence up with a different company. That was a $10,000 lesson. Then La Paz. So we bought land in La Paz. And we're pretty good at buying land. We got that down. Bought some land. There was a canal going through the back that was going to free up more land. So we were smart enough to say, hey, we'll give you some money now and the balance when the canal goes through the back. Because I knew the chances of the canal actually going through the back were less than what I was being told, let's just say. Sure enough, the canal never goes through the back, so at least we're only into it for about a million dollars for what we did pay into it. And we thought, well, we did pretty well. We paid a million dollars. The part of the land we have is worth that. Walmart went in about three blocks away. Land's probably worth about three million now. This is a good deal. And then we heard from a developer there, why are you building on your land? I thought you were going to have me be the engineer. And I'm like, we're not building on our land. He goes, well, somebody is building on your land. And to cut to the chase, there's a lovely gentleman named Felix Diaz. The Diaz brothers do oil. Um, the, se the seller who sold us our land sold it to the Diaz brothers after us. So now we're in a lawsuit in La Paz over ownership of land. Now, when I tell my Mexican friends this, they've got, it's just a big yawn. It's like, oh yeah, it happens all the time. Okay, here's what doesn't happen all the time. We're on lawyer number seven. The first lawyer we got on this, I got by recommendations from one of the top developers in Mexico, who's a friend of mine, and his in-house lawyer recommended this guy. Turns out the guy's not even a lawyer, and when we found out, he skipped town to Washington. Lawyers number two and three, uh, a male-female team thought, oh, I'm sorry, lawyer number two was not a lawyer either. He just pretended to be a lawyer from the very beginning. Lawyers three and four, lawyer four got shot the day before he testified or went into court on our behalf. So his partner, lawyer number three, exited quickly thereafter. See, I've got to remember them all because it's like remembering, it's like remembering the seven dwarfs, you know? It's like sleepy, dopey, happy, grumpy, and you always forget one, you know? You always forget one of the seven dwarfs and you realize, oh, it's Doc or Bashful, right? So. This, these lawyers were like this parade of lawyers coming through. One was kind of slimy, and I didn't trust him, and he tried an amparo, and that didn't work. And, and, and this is with clear evidence. This is with, we have, you know, we paid taxes in our name, we've got everything in our name, and we're still embroiled in a lawsuit, and we're on lawyer number seven. Try explaining that to investors in the U.S., who've never dealt with that. Now, I worked for McGraw-Hill and Standard Poor's for a while. I had lawyers on speed dial. We got sued all the time, but you kind of knew the path. And here, the path is unknown. And, and when you don't have that sense of truly knowing what the path is, that uncertainty is just very, very hard to deal with because uncertainty means risk, and risk means more money. So it costs you more. So then... Let's move to the one that's even tenfold that, is the labor laws. We hired a U.S. person who was also Mexican. She had both citizenships like I do. We hired her U.S. company to go down to Mexico, set up our operations in Mexico, and be sure she obeyed all Mexican laws. Because we hadn't done business in Mexico anymore, or before. So we hired her to do that. She goes down there. She sets up the company. She only violates one law. She does not put herself on EAMS. 
We thought that's okay. She's an American with an American company. We're paying her in U.S. dollars. She's just down there setting this stuff up. She turned out to embezzle 600,000 pesos. She took all of our documents and then tried to extort us to give them back, including all of our banks and checks and everything like that. And then she turned around and sued us in labor court for not paying her EMS and said we paid her $17,000 a month. Who here makes $17,000 a month? If you are, I have a great company for you to buy. So here's this woman now, theft, extortion, suing us for millions of dollars, and in Mexico, you're guilty until proven innocent. That's huge. And on top of that, she doesn't just sue the company. She sues me personally. Still want to do business in Mexico? Am I getting some of you now? <laughs> she sues me personally. Now, in the U.S., I've been sued all kinds of times because they do that when you've got a big company and you're doing lots of business. People just kind of see what they can get. A lot of times it's settled. And, but you, you get the court to opt the persons out because there's a corporate veil. And that corporate bail is really, really important in the U.S. because it allows you to go in and do business without worrying about everything you've saved and built on in your life. Well, all that gets put into jeopardy in Mexico because you ride right along with the lawsuit all the way to the end. And if your pockets are deeper, they go after your pockets. That will stop your heart. So... We're sitting there wondering what to do because we actually did, you know, according to the labor courts, they think we violated labor law. And we say, well, no, she's the one who violated. And they said, well, take that up in civil court or some other court. But it, this is labor court. So we're dealing with that. And then I realized that the way to solve this is very different. Mexican problem, Mexican solution. We hired a criminal attorney and we threw her in jail because I was not going to settle with somebody who stole and extorted and then sued us maliciously. That sends a bad message to everybody else who works for you that they can do the same. And technically they could. Any employee could leave your hire and go to labor court and sue you and hope for a settlement. At the most, it's going to cost you well over 100000 to fight it probably twice that. So I went to my investors and I said, okay, look, we can settle, she, you know, the, the lawsuit's in millions, but she'll probably settle for about 50000 Or we can fight it. And if we fight it, it's going to cost us over 100000 And they said, what would you like to do? And I said, I'd like to fight it. I'd like to send a message for anyone who would come after that we play fair, but we play right, and we're willing to stand behind it. And 30 investors unanimously voted to fight it. Um, we, we put her in jail, which was no easy task. We actually had to do a sting operation because even when you get a warrant for someone's arrest and you know where they live and you know where they work, the police did not go pick her up. We actually had to bring her to the police. And that's another story. That's a, a novel. So I tell you the story in detail because these things are shocking. Now, keep, keep all of this keep in mind. We are doing triple-digit growth in the business. Storage and parking is wonderful in Mexico. There's all these opportunities. Yet layered on this is labor laws and accounting laws and banking laws. And you just feel like you are playing whack-a-mole, that game where you're just hitting every little monster that pops up. And that is why a lot of people who come to do business in Mexico bring partners. Because the Mexicans know this. They've been through it. What I know now versus five years ago is huge. None of the things that happened to us will ever happen to us again. But I just wonder what else is out there, right? So now we actually are. We're looking for a Mexican partner to work with us because we don't know what else is out there. And a bigger company 
has people on retainer to do that. And that's one of the reasons most of the innovation, think about it. When did you see the last Facebook come out of Mexico or Crocs or all these innovative things that always seem to be coming out of the U.S. from some no-name kid who went to Stanford or Harvard or something like that or who knows where? You don't see a lot of them in Mexico. What you see in Mexico is entrepreneurship. That's what I did at Standard & Poor's. When I was at Standard & Poor's, I created businesses all the time inside the company. I went to the bosses, and if the bosses said yes, they'd give me millions of dollars, and I could go do what I wanted to do. It was wonderful. Well, when you're from a big Mexican family that has two or three different commercial enterprises, you can do that. You can go to mom, dad, grandpa, get the money, and start this stuff And they already have the accounting down. They already have the lawyers down. They already have all the protections. And that's why you see entrepreneurship thriving in Mexico, but entrepreneurship is having a tough time. Because when you are taxed 3% just to put cash in the bank, what do you do? You don't put cash in the bank. Unless you have Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, then you put the cash in the bank. So you don't put the cash in the bank. Small business is incented to criminal activity. That's harsh. So the government of Mexico really has to think about its policies and what it's doing to small businesses. And we haven't even gotten into the female working in Mexico and how many times I've been told I can't succeed because I'm a woman. And you just saw some amazing women up here who are succeeding. And that is a new, younger Mexico that I see. And I'm talking with a lot of young Mexicans now. They're educated all over the world, and they are bringing something to Mexico that's just amazing. And, and that's what I want to end with, is going back to the good. There are reforms going on now. Some of them, if you live in the Baja, the 16% EVA, I hate it. I don't think you should have EVA equal to the rest of the country if you don't have power and water equal to the rest of the country. I think it should be on a sliding scale. However many days your water is on and your electricity is on, that's the percentage of time you should pay for water and electricity, especially commercial electricity, as I said. That's just a, a gripe of mine. I'm actually thinking about building Um, uh, like a little mini power plant on site to convert high power to low power energy just to get around some of that. But again, the opportunities are here. Everywhere you look, something's kind of broken, and broken is opportunity because you, any one of you, might be the one to fix that. And when you can fix it, there's opportunity for advancement and growth if you have the right partners. But the biggest thing, the biggest good that I see in Mexico is the people. Because the people in Mexico, oh, he went back. Hold on. Let's see if I can bring that back. Can you take me to the last slide? Look, a recap. They say at the end of the speech you're supposed to tell people what you told them. Well, here you go. We're seeing the whole thing all over. So did you notice in the last panel How many times the word love was used and it wasn't followed by money? I love money. No. It was love what you do or bring love into what you're doing, all these kinds of things. That, that's missing. I, I hate to say it. I mean, there's, there's some people who I know who are Mexicans and they go, oh, I hate to say this about Mexico, but this is the you know, truth. Well, I hate to say this about the USA, but, you know, this is the truth. Um, we're lacking in this. We don't hug strangers. And if we hug strangers, I think we do business a little better. I love that about Mexico. I love that my father was a passionate man and who taught us virtue and how to grow a business with integrity. And I am hoping that I bring that to my business. But the Mexican people, and the people who work for me, even the ones who, who've taken money because it was sitting there, right? There's something about them that has such integrity. Hurricane Odile hit Cabo. It wiped out a lot. We did very, very well in it. But the guy who lives on site, 
His trailer was knocked over. It was completely destroyed. Rather than leave the site, and he couldn't reach me because all communications were down. He couldn't reach me, but rather than leave the site, he sent his wife and baby to the family, and he stayed in his car for three weeks. That kind of loyalty and integrity, I don't know if that would have happened in the U.S. This is when people were looting and people protecting their homes. He did a schedule where the minimum staff could be on site, even though there were no customers, just so that all the rest of the staff could go and protect their homes. That is why I love doing business in Mexico. And I'm figuring the rest out. <laughs> Um, it is tough, it is challenging, it's fascinating. But I encourage any of you who do have more questions, please feel free to ask me. And again, you know, Viva Mexico. Thank you. I loved it when you were talking about monthly accounting and you had a devil right there. Then I realized somebody else feels like I feel. Me encantó cuando estaba hablando de la contabilidad mensual y había un diablito ahí. Como que dije, me sentí identificada. Alguien más lo visualiza como yo. Entonces, contabilidad, impuestos, no. Y veía el diablito y dije, bueno, no soy la única. Si tenemos preguntas, eh, con muchísimo gusto las va a responder. Les pediría solo de favor levantarse y hablar fuerte para que ella los escuche. ¿Alguien tiene alguna duda? ¿Alguien tiene alguna pregunta para Lu? Por favor. Are you familiar with the business incubators in Mexico and uh, what do you think about them if you saw? ¿Tienes conoces las incubadoras de negocios en México y qué es lo que piensas de ellas? I'm familiar with some of them and learning about more. A good friend of mine is now the head of the Kaufman Center for Entrepreneurship, which is one of the largest foundations in the world to support entrepreneurship. And he asked me to work with him on concentrating more on Mexico and the U.S. and their relationship with each other. And what I've been trying to, to tell them is normally Kaufman Center works with entrepreneurs themselves on how to grow their businesses. And I've told them that unless they work on the policy level to clear the way for entrepreneurship, that entrepreneurs will hit a lot of the same things I did and not be able to survive it from the pure economics of it. I mean, I've got, you know, PhD level economics. I've got all this experience and it's still just, you know, pulling nails that are glued down. Um, So that's the problem that incubators are going to have. Unless you get one that's on the level of a policy-making influence, I, I, I don't want to say never say never because there's always that one person, there's always that Carlos Slim, you know, that kind of gets up there and does what he does. Um, we won't go into the ethics behind that, but um, but it's just not going to ramp up the way it needs to ramp up until you deal with the policy level. And by that, you might mean also simplify what you have to go through, because that's always an issue here in, in Tijuana. No, yeah. The government says it's easy, everybody come do it, but then it takes you forever. That's right. Como de alguna forma simplificar los tramites, que es algo que, que el gobierno nos dice, Está aquí, ven, en, vengan emprendedores y está listo para ustedes, pero si el trámite te toma meses, pues ya se te acabó a lo mejor el recurso que tenías presupuestado para eso y es muy complicado y, y creo que más o menos a eso se refería. ¿Alguien tiene alguna otra pregunta? No, sí, pregunten, de veras. Happy that you have faith in everything that is coming, but uh, yes, I, I, I like that you like our people, and, and there are so many things I am, I, I felt kind of sorry for you, uh, and, uh, but I'm glad that you are still working on it. 
Thank you. <laughs> Remember, I, I said in the very beginning that no one's an entrepreneur because they want to be. Um, I have a daughter now, and, and I tell her to run. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, she just won a state business plan competition, so I don't think she's running from entrepreneurship for it. But, um, but once you do it, you don't have much choice. You're just doing it. The thing that I'm lucky to do is that because of the positions that I have in public companies, I'm hoping I can make a difference on the policy level. And I will tell you the reason I took this speaking engagement was to talk and, and let people know what a little company goes through so that, so that they can see how to help small business grow. How if you're a contador out there, the rates should be different like they are in the U.S. Because if you can give really good rates to a small company, they will become your big client. They will stay with you forever. The same with the, the lawyers out there. You know, if you can establish these relationships when these companies are young. And that's not done here. It, the opposite is done. It's pay me money in advance because I don't think you're going to pay. And that's the opposite thinking of what needs to happen to really have small business grow here. You know, I just want to say one more thing that I didn't... I want to tell you the reason I'm speaking in English. Because my father was born in Mexico. And we were not allowed to speak Spanish in our house in California. Now, this was the days of World War II and Japanese internment and... It was very important, you know, we're in America, we're Americans, we speak English. When my grandmother would come to visit and talk in Spanish with my father, they were asked to go into a different room because it was impolite to speak another language in the house. Do you know what I would give to be fluent in Spanish right now? I could cry when I think about that. I will never, I mean, my Spanish is okay, I can understand, but... I can't do the speech in Spanish because there are subtleties I can't get across that I want to get across. Qué lástima. So my daughter has been in Spanish immersion school since kindergarten. She's a child of the world. She'll be a businesswoman of the world. And she is not only bilingual, she's bicultural, which is even more important than being bilingual. So I encourage you, not because I'm English-centric, to have your children study English, study any other foreign language, but our children are going to inherit a world, not a country, not a town, not Tijuana, but todo el mundo. ¿Alguien más tiene preguntas? Por favor, el micrófono nada más esperamos a que llegue rápido para que podamos todos escuchar. ¿Dónde quedó? Ahí viene el micrófono. Since you talked about energy, which way do you think companies well Solar energy companies here in Mexico, what direction should they take? I like that question. Um, the problem with solar en energy, again, is on the policy level. Until you can feed back into the grid, solar energy will never take off in Mexico. We have hundreds of square feet, square meters, of roof space. I wanted to put solar power on all of them. And I wanted to feed the energy back into the community because these are very expensive pieces of equipment, solar panels. You can't do that in Mexico. You can do it in the US. And in the US, we have solar. But in Mexico, not only can we not feed back into the grid, meaning, you understand what feedback into the grid it means you create more power than you use so you can go back into CFE and they pay you for the power because basically you're a cleaner power than what they're pulling out of the ground. They're about to start punching holes in the Gulf of Mexico and all across Mexico to pull fossil fuels out. Yet you've got all these people willing to do solar, all these companies willing to do solar, provide clean energy that's coming straight into the grid and it hasn't happened. That's a policy. That's a weekend retreat. 
That's what's got to happen. So when that doesn't happen, you just, it's like sleuthing in one of these movies where it's like, okay, follow the money. Why isn't that happening? And that's the question you have to answer. Why isn't that happening? Because that could solve energy problems much faster. And of course, the other thing is theft. Um, that because they're so expensive in Mexico, you put a solar panel up and, you know, it has a life expectancy of about, you know, how long does it take to eat a taco? That's a problem. ¿Alguna otra pregunta? ¿Alguien más? ¿Tiene dudas? ¿No? Bueno, entonces les pido un muy, muy fuerte aplauso para Lu Córdoba. Thank you so much for being in Tijuana. And don't leave, don't leave yet. Come up to the center stage. And I also thank you for believing in Mexico. I guess I agree with somebody saying we're so happy that people see in our country our people. That's what we're working for every day. So thank you so much. And I'm going to ask Jaime González Luna, vicepresidente de Tijuana Innovadora, que nos acompañe aquí al centro para entregar un reconocimiento. Bueno, antes de... Do you understand Spanish? Un poco. Antes de entregarle un reconocimiento a Lu, la plática estuvo extraordinaria, pero dura, ¿eh? ¿Sí o no? Dura porque nos hace ver realidades que ya conocemos. I'm, I'm telling them, probably you understand me. The, it was very good, your presentation. Very tough, you know? Uh, I think there's um, one... We are, as Mexicans, as Tijuana Innovadora, as Tijuanans, we are fighting that. We understand what you're saying, we understand where you're coming from, and it's really tough, you know, because uh, the people that are here, I'm sure, because they're here, are in the 30% of Mexico that think differently, that we want a different country, that we want a different, and it's a process, a long process. But what I see, and I want to clarify a little bit, is two things. One is that uh, you're wrong about something. Tijuana. I'm wrong about muchas cosas. Oh, me too. <laughs> but Tijuana is an amazing spot, Baja California. And I'll give you even four examples. One, Jordi Muñoz and Chris Anderson, they met here in 2010, Tijuana Innovadora, and Jordi Muñoz, he's from Tijuana, and he was building drones in his garage. ¿Se acuerdan de Jordi Muñoz? And he has now, today, a company. He, he made a partnership uh, with Chris Anderson, and they made a company called uh, 3D Robotics. They sell $20 million a year now, uh -huh. in four years. And that's Mexican technology. We have 200 engineers from here, working on that factory that is in Otay Mesa close by. Then we have uh, another guy that we, we had here. His, his name is Adrian Peregrino. Do you know him? No. He's the guy that invented, he's a Mexican guy, and he invented it Spotify, you know, the application for, for the music. Yeah. Yo la tengo en mi celular. Yeah. It's cool. <laughs> and so he was here also. And uh, we have another guy that his name is Andres Reyes Botello. He, he has a company that is called Voxel. And he's here in Tijuana also. And he makes all the animation for movies from Disney, from Warner Brothers. And he just was involved in a, in a movie made in Tijuana. Uh, it's the first 3D uh, uh, cartoon. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be showed up in December or January next year. And it's called El Americano. And it's okay. called a, a, a Little Cotorro. ¿Ya saben de esa película o no? Eh? De, es, es la película del, del americano, eh, es, es una película que hizo Ricardo Arnaiz con Andrés Reyes Botello, está eh, Edward James Olmos, eh, Adal Ramones que viene aquí, and, and the movie is, is the first 3D movie, cartoon movie eh, from Mexico, and all the animation was made here in Tijuana. So there, there's, yes, there's some uh, a, a sh shift in technology, uh, there's huge companies like Plantronics, Medtronics, that all the design is done here in Tijuana. I, I know another one. Which one? I know one here. I, I know one more. Several, several years ago, uh, an American woman 
dual nationality, came to Tijuana Innovadora, listened to a speaker talk about development, got in contact with the speaker, formed a very wonderful relationship, not only with that speaker, but some of the other people who had also come to Tijuana Innovadora. And that woman is now the first person to bring self-storage into Mexico, and she'll be incredibly successful at some point. I'm sure she's going to do that. And you know, Mexico, like any foreign country, for someone that comes from, even though you, you have a, your Mexican passport, which we love, uh, you have, and that's my advice as a businessman, you have to partner up with the right people. Absolutely. And by listening to you, and it's not news to me, but by listening to you, I see the mistakes of people that get the wrong advisors. You know, because yeah. we have huge companies, and you know about it, Lou. We have, you know, we're the fifth maker, automaker in the world, you know. And we have Toyota making here products. We have, a, you know, 700 maquiladoras. And, you know, so you have to get, and I'll, I'll help you with that. You know, I'm, I'm part of a, a, co a company called the Tijuana EDC, okay. Tijuana Economic Development Corporation. And we can give you uh, information on, on lawyers, accountants, everything. And, you know, why? Because we want you to say, we want people to invest in Mexico. We want them to, to partner up with Mexico. Yeah. It's a pleasure to have you here. You. Uh, you said many things that we're working on, that we believe we need to change in our country. And, and it's, it's great to have you here. It's great to have you investing here. And we want you to keep doing that. Well, there's a big difference that I'm seeing. There, there's a big difference between the generations. And I wrote a, a paper on it for my investors, and it was called The Old Mexico and New Mexico. When we started our project, we went out to some of the big Mexican families to invest and talk to the elders of the family. And they were very interested. They wanted 51% of the company. And they strangely had a third son that they wanted to bring in to run it. In fact, this happened so much with the third son that I was wondering, well, the first son took over the business and the second son you know, spun out something else. But maybe the third son, they were already rich when he came along and he was just a dilettante and they just had to give him something easy. I don't know. But what I found now is that that next generation that has studied worldwide, they don't have the same perspective. And they're branching out and they're doing passive investments, they're doing co-investments, they're doing things that are much more internationally focused. Very, very different group of people than, say, the ones, uh, you know, my father's age. Yes. Very, very different. And, and, and now that you mentioned that, yes, an applause for her. Now that you mentioned that, that is going to help change the country. Why? Exactly, because we'll force the policies, and that's why... Eh, por eso la juventud, y, to, y yo me creo joven, y todos ustedes son jóvenes, tenemos que empujar a nuestro país a no aceptar las corruptelas, a no aceptar las cochinadas y hacer lo que muchas veces los extranjeros vienen y hacen, que es tratar de hacer las cosas derechas. Pero también habemos mucha gente que lo hacemos así y salimos adelante. Lou, it's a pleasure to have you here. It's an honor. Thank you for the presentation. Un aplauso. Y le voy a pedir, I'm going to ask eh, Patty to give us a present, a special present for you. Bueno. Muy bueno. De nuestra tierra, de Baja California. Qué rico. Ahorita vamos a ir a brindar. And de mujer pyme. Y le voy a pedir a, a, a Pati que le entregue. This uh, signifies the pride that we take as Tijuana Innovadora, as Tijuanenses, to help and improve our community. And you help us today to do that. Thank you very much. And she lives here. Okay. Tenemos que hacerle el saludo de Tijuana Innovadora. We have to... to
Gracias, Jaime, Patti. Thank you.